Welcome to Aviation This Week on Channels Television. I'm Bukola Joe Oketsumbi. Flights originating from Europe to Nigeria total 43 frequencies every week. The Middle East has 56 flights weekly into multiple cities into Nigeria, and those airlines include Emirates and Qatar. Do these multiple entries based on bilateral air service agreements between nations deplete local airline operations or even impact on the national economy? That and more were the questions participants provided answers to at a forum in Lagos. Plus, meet South Africa's first black female pilot and how she's inspiring other young girls to take to aviation. That's our sneak preview. Let's fly. Local airlines and aviation stakeholders have been pushing back on the federal government's policy on multiple destinations that are called multiple landing rights to foreign carriers and is said to be an alleged exploitation of the local aviation market valued at about $400 billion. Before now, Nigeria and the United Arab Emirates had a spot over the withdrawal of approval of flight frequencies for Emirates Airlines and the refusal of the Middle East country to grant airfields reciprocal slots. This exposed Nigeria's flawed bilateral aviation service agreements. The matter has since been settled. Currently, Qatar Airways has expanded its network in Nigeria, adding Kano and Port Harcourt to the previous destinations of Lagos and Abuja, making it four cities that Qatar flies in in Nigeria. Late last year, Ethiopia returned to Enugu after a two-year hiatus, making it four gateways for the carrier as well. The economic implication of opening up Nigeria's flanks is the focus at this aviation roundtable forum. Britain alone is doing 21 flights into Lagos and Abuja and Port Harcourt. Britain by two airlines of British Airways and Virgin. They go to your Abuja, go to Lagos, go to Port Harcourt, go to Kano. My conclusion therefore is We have zero participation in the international sector as an airline. For countries to exercise landing rights between themselves, this is usually based on what is described as bilateral air service agreements. But the numerous entry points for foreign carriers into the country hit back at local airline operations. And the domestic sector is completely eroded through domestic entry multiple points. If I can fly from Dubai straight to Abuja, Dubai straight to Port Harcourt, Dubai straight to Kano, I wonder if the airpiece wants to go to UAE, if he has three other points he wants to fly to. Or if he wants to go to Ethiopia, once he lands in Addis Ababa, domestic flights has to take you to any other point. While there is need for policy review, critical interest parties have listed corruption, inconsistent policies, and lack of capacity by the country's airlines as some of the reasons Nigerian carriers are not benefiting from the numerous agreements. The crime here is that we are not maximizing economically what is ours and a lot of people like us for that because oh in nigeria it's so easy to do business after bilateral air services agreement in terms of operation should be the result of a commercial agreement between your designated airline and that foreign airline must be that's the way it was and it is the only way we can go forward. The obvious, the federal government did defend its position, saying the multiple entry points in granted foreign airlines would generate revenue for the country. 
At the meeting, the Minister of Aviation, Senator Hadi Sirika, who sent in a statement, insists that these entries will help domestic airlines improve on the distribution and connection opportunities. But many wonder how. He also added that multiple entry points are granted to foreign airlines based on the nature of their bilateral service agreements. But many here do not agree and even query the cancellation of royalties payments by foreign airlines operating in the country by former Minister of Aviation in 2012. Point of landing, all of them one one. Frequencies, the type of aircraft, the capacity, if one does not use its own, it borrows the one that is operating. Those are simple terms. All of these things could change, but on agreement. If you don't go on your normal frequency, you go into commercial agreement between the two airlines of the country, and you pay a royalty. As of the last count, Nigeria has about 92 buses with several countries, but about 28 have been served with only seven reciprocities by Nigerian airlines, mostly within the West African region. The airline operators of Nigeria, represented by its Vice President, Mr. Alan Oyema, also had a say at the forum. That's on our interview segment. So that airlines are invited when we are going for Barca. Some of them have complained that when you go to Barca and you say something, they tell you you're not supposed to be hard. Uh, uh, like an advice, but not stand up against anything there. And when you finish this Barca, are they telling me that Nigeria Airlines were invited where the decision was taken that Turkish Airlines, Emirates, Ethiopia and so many others that airlines were present and agreed that this multiple designation, multiple designation being given to foreign airlines into this country is a great is one of the greatest disservice to the economy and the people of Nigeria. There is no other way to kill. the growth or to stunt the growth of aviation in this country other than this way. You cannot encourage your airlines to stand on a strong footing by inviting other people into the house to destroy that foundation on which they are supposed to stand on. All the foreign airlines that come to Nigeria ravage our economy. Every day the central bank government cries about the amount of money being repatriated abroad. We are talking about scarcity of foreign exchange in this country. But the foreign airlines are removing billions of dollars every year from this country. And airlines in Nigeria have been questioned by the central bank government. What are you people doing? Why are you not doing these flights? Where do I get this? Where am I going to get all this money on my table? There, I have a lot of requests for billions of dollars to be repatriated. Where are we going to get this from? And yet, we are creating more avenues, inadvertently or deliberately, for these things to be happening by giving multiple destinations to these foreign airlines. All the foreign airlines that come to this country, maybe about 20 or 30 of them, Put all of them together. The totality of employment they've given to Nigeria is not up to 150 people. And I'll tell you how. They bring in their national or their hired hands into the country to represent them at the top level as managers. Then they go to the ground handling service people, maybe they go to SACO or NACO or they don't have forgotten their names and pay them to use their staff. Those people are still using the same staff. The same staff of those people that will work for APIS or work for British Airways 
the same people were doing where it takes off, they moved to Lufthansa. From there to move to the other world. We give red carpet treatment to foreign airlines to the detriment of indigenous airlines. It didn't start today. How could Airbus be going to Dubai and you have Qatar flying to Kano to Dubai, doing uh to Dubai, doing Abu Dhabi to Dubai, doing Lagos to Dubai? How do you want that Nigerian airline to survive? And we all keep quiet. How do these local airlines become strong when the foreign airlines are allowed to come and do domestic traveling, domestic operations in the name of international operations in your country? No country allows that. Not even the United States with all this powerful economy and everything in aviation. They don't allow that. Even ordinary private jets, if you fly a private jet to the United States, maybe you're going to Atlanta, New York is nearer, you land in New York to refuel, they will allow you. You take off from New York, you move over to uh, uh, Atlanta, you, they will ground that plane there. Wherever you want to go to, again, the United States, you, you are not allowed to fly in that, your private plane again, as a foreigner. You must, they make you to use their own indigenous airlines to go to other places. When you want to go, you go back the way you came. This is even a private charter, not to talk of scheduled commercial aviation. You allow Qatar to land in Kano. From Kano, they go to Port uh, uh, to Abuja, then Abuja back to their country. We are going to fizzle out soon. That is the. That is the that is the thrust of this paper from AON. Except something is done and done immediately. Not even, AON is no longer ready to wait for another one month for this thing to be resigned. Terminal 2 of the Motala Mohammed International Airport in Lagos. This is the latest of Nigeria's five new international terminals occupying a landmass of approximately 56,000 square meters. New technology also dots the expansive space. The $100 million terminal has been described as aesthetically pleasing, with wall murals celebrating the symbols of Lagos. There are also two giant artworks, one the talking drum with room for seating. The, the drum is giant, as you could see. <laughs> so if you look closely um, at the, uh, the, 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 the interesting, this interesting piece, if you look from a, from a considerable distance, you, you realize that uh, it's actually from uh, it is a shape of, of a drum, you know, a drum called gongon in Yoruba land. This is a traditional uh, talking drum. And even sitting it, you know, we, we, have, we made provision for sitting within the drum. And the second called the Lagos Pyramids. Components are a combination of uh, paintings and reflective glasses uh, firmly held in place to the ground uh, by metals, which run through a wooden platform. So these are all carefully arranged with uh, precision uh, to, to form the pyramid, um, the, the pyramid shape that we see there. Compositions of these uh, well-aligned paintings are a reflection of activities and culture of Lagos and the people of the state. And the one uh, interesting thing about the, Le the, the Lagos Pyramid is, is the fact that the travelers and the visitors can interact closely 
you know. So what do I mean? People can actually walk through. I'm sure a lot of people, they are yet to find out that they can walk through and walk in between those pyramids on, the, on this platform. Come travel through the new 14 million passenger capacity terminal. It looks like a onesie, like, you know, a kid with a onesie and the thing, yeah, because it was so big, because it wasn't made for, you know, for females. Meet Shufilwe Ledwaba, she's South Africa's first black female helicopter pilot for the police service. It's been a journey for the 40-year-old who first had eyes for the medical profession after bagging a degree in biochemistry. It was only after I finished university that due to a whole lot of circumstances, I ended up in an airline as a cabin attendant. And that's when I started getting uh, like exposed to the aviation industry even more and understanding what it was. So that initial flight that um, there that ignited that initial interest. And when I started working for an airline and I found this fascinating career and I thought, hmm, I can, you know, I can always, I can fly, I can go to the front instead of being at the back. So, I mean, that's where it pretty much started. With over 20 years of practice as a helicopter and fixed wing plane pilot, as well as a flight instructor, Rafilwe is looking backwards to groom those who will fill her shoes with her Girls Fly program, Africa Foundation. So we wanted to create you know, initially sort of a similar platform where young women can see other women that look like them doing you know, a career like that. Number two, information as well is important from a very young age they know that aviation or any or space industry is a career choice for them. We join this year's camp for flight simulation tour. Right, right. Eh. More. Okay, More. More. Presser. Okay. Eh, eh. No left. Yeah. This is the first time that I'm doing something like this, so I'm excited. Like, it's the first time. I don't even believe it. Being in the simulator was very exciting, but nerve-wracking at the same time. I have never ever been in a flight before. This was literally my first experience. This experience was extremely mind-blowing. Very interesting, but also mind-blowing. More than 100,000 young girls, mostly from rural communities like Rifilwe, in Botswana, Kenya, Cameroon, and South Africa, have participated in this pipeline program, which comprises schools outreach programs, as well as experiential workshops and camps like this. Rafinwe says there are success stories to show. We've got aeronautical engineers that are in the workplace. We've got uh, young girls that are doing masters in aeronautical engineers in the UK. We have girls that have become air traffic controllers. So they are a lot. And if you go on our website, we actually profile them uh, where they are and what they're doing, you know, to tell the story. The Girls Fly Program Africa also mentors boys on their school's outreach programs. But Rafilwe believes that for Africa to be even greater, there must be a deliberate focus on girls to change mindsets, even theirs, on what's possible. The House of Representatives Committee on Aviation has asked the Federal Airports Authority of Nigeria, FAN, to put all necessary measures in place to avert a repeat of the type of power outage experienced at the finger arrival of the international wing of the Muritala Mohammed Airport, Ikeja, Lagos, last week. The D-finger arrival was thrown into darkness for over 15 minutes on Friday the 1st of April at about 11.15 p.m. at the time the Air France passengers were disembarking for facilitation. The Director General of the Nigeria Civil Aviation Authority, NCAA, Captain Musa Nuhu, noted that what the terminal required was total remodeling and rewiring of the cables as the only way of solving the problems which have become a recurring issue. EasyJet Airline says it has been forced to cancel some flights to and from Britain after a new surge in COVID-19 left it facing higher than normal staff sickness levels. England, which dropped all its coronavirus restrictions earlier this year, has seen a new surge in COVID-19 in recent weeks, with one in 13 people believed to have been infected in the week ending March the 26th, the highest since the pandemic began. While hospitalization levels are well below previous peaks in 2020 and 2021, companies are reporting disruptions in their services, including in airports, due to staff needing to stay at home. EasyJet cancelled around 60 flights to and from Britain on Monday, 
out of around 1,645 that were scheduled. British Airways also made a small number of cancellations. AirAsia bringing in the first set of passengers into Kuala Lumpur. Malaysia has reopened its borders on Friday, April the 1st, allowing entry without quarantine for visitors vaccinated against COVID-19, much to the delight of travelers. Malaysia has since March 2020 maintained some of the tightest entry curbs in Asia to try to contain COVID outbreaks, with most foreign nationals barred from entry and returning Malaysians required to undergo quarantine. Now to Singapore, where excitement from Changi Airport staff is palpable as the country has also lifted its quarantine requirements for all vaccinated travelers, joining a string of countries in Asia, moving more firmly towards a living with the virus approach. Singapore had earlier also dropped requirements to wear masks outdoors and allowed larger groups to gather. The U.S. National Transportation Safety Board says it is assisting Chinese investigators with the download of the cockpit voice recorder from China Eastern Airlines Flight 5735 in Washington. China's decision to send a key piece of evidence to Washington shows the urgency of the investigation at a time when the two nations have been at odds over other issues. On March the 21st, the Boeing jet crashed into a mountainside in southern China, killing all 132 people on board. It was mainland China's deadliest aviation disaster in 28 years. The cockpit voice recorder will likely provide investigators with details of communication between the flight's three pilots, which is one more than is normally required on board the Boeing plane. The International Space Station is set to become busier when its crew welcomes aboard four new colleagues from Houston-based startup Axiom Space, the first all-private astronaut team ever flown to the orbiting outpost. The launch is being hailed by the company, NASA and older industry players as a turning point in the latest expansion of commercial space ventures collectively referred to by insiders as the Low Earth Orbit Economy, or LEO Economy for short. We're like early days of internet. And we haven't even imagined all the possibilities, all the capabilities that we're going to be providing uh, in space. So Weather permitting, Axiom's four-man team will lift up on Friday, April the 8th at the LAS from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida, riding atop a Falcon 9 rocket furnished and flown by Elon Musk commercial space launch venture SpaceX. If all goes smoothly, the quartet will arrive at the space station 28 hours later as their SpaceX supply Dragon capsule docks at ISS some 250 miles above Earth. We now know that when you go to space, there's a little bit of acceleration in aging, right? And so we're doing some clinical research and saying, wow, if, if there's a little acceleration, can, you know, and identifying what causes that accident. Leading the team is Lopez Alegre, 63, the Spanish-born mission commander and Axiom's vice president of business development. He's said to be joined by Larry Connor, a real estate and technology entrepreneur and also an aerobatics aviator from Ohio, designated as the mission pilot. Connor is in his 70s. Rounding out the AX1 team are investor, philanthropist, and former Israeli fighter pilot Aitan Stibe, 64, and Canadian businessman and philanthropist Mark Pathy, 52, both serving as mission specialists. Stibe is said to become the second Israeli in space after Ilan Ramon, who perished with six NASA crewmates in the 2003 Space Shuttle Columbia disaster. Axiom has said it has contracted with SpaceX to fly three more missions to orbit over the next two years. NASA selected Axiom in 2020 to design and develop a new commercial wing to the space station, which currently spans the approximate size of a football field. This is our final destination on the program. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. I'm Bukola Joe Okitsumbi.